All right, everyone, uh, welcome back to Natural Awakening, a podcast about uh, awakening, naturalism, um, science, and whatever else uh, fits into that, that region of, of interests. Uh, today, my guest is the eminent uh, Dr. Daniel Ingram, and uh, welcome, Daniel. Today, we're going to be talking about the Emergent Phenomenology Research Consortium and uh, its various research interests and projects. And for those, although I figure it'll probably be rather few, but for those who don't know already who you are, or what you do, could you let them in? Sure. So I'm Dr. Daniel Ingram. I have a MD, was a practicing emergency medicine physician for 12 years, also did some healthcare administration, also got some epidemiology training along the way somewhere. And also, in parallel to that, was doing a lot of deep dive meditation, a lot of meditation retreats, got very into some very technical uh, aspects of meditation and a tradition that emphasized states and stages and progress and paths and all of that kind of stuff, and then ended up writing that book there, uh, Mastering the Core Teachings of the Buddha. And then in an attempt with me and a bunch of my friends who also had the sense that there was one aspect of us that was had all this spectacular phenomenology and strange adventures and sometimes very challenging experiences happened to them and but yet ultimately felt it was beneficial if yet sometimes challenging um, you know we had had these experiences and then we also had these professional backgrounds mostly at this at this point it was a lot of people in phds and mds and stuff and now the eprc is a whole lot of other people with, without those kinds of degrees and with those kinds of degrees and sometimes two of those degrees <laughs> and uh this kind of thing uh that had this sort of background which is training in a world that really knew almost nothing about the deep dive that had been so important to us and then we all realized we needed to form like a third um, not only aspect of ourselves, but also a group that represented the collective of that third aspect, the sort of we of this, which is a group that was looking at both the, the state of the mainstream world of clinical medicine and which was obviously woefully inadequate to really characterize the, the interesting and fascinating adventures we had all been on. And then trying to figure out how we use very neutral, objective phenomenology-based science and neuroimaging and outcomes research and those sorts of epistemological modes to try to figure out how these two aspects can get along a whole lot better understand each other much more skillfully, contribute to a much more productive dialogue, clinical competence, you know, detailed sense of underlying physiology, epidemiology, incidences and prevalences. And then the question is, how do you communicate that to the population at large? And that became the Emergent Phenomenology Research Consortium, which is now has over 100 members and um, spans a whole lot of countries and people from lots of different disciplines. So it's very multidisciplinary. Um, and then eventually the charity emergence benefactors that would try to figure out where the few hundred million dollars this is going to take comes from. And so that's the adventure we now all find ourselves on. And so I help to run the charity and help to organize the EPRC and volunteer my time these days. I don't get paid for any of this, helping to coordinate all these efforts of all these amazing people around the world who share this common vision of trying to figure out how to accomplish this project, which we think will require decades. We think this is generational change. We think we'll take hundreds of millions of dollars and hundreds of researchers around the globe from a diverse, diverse array of traditions, but we're going to get to talk about all of that. So that's what brings us here today. All right. That was an excellent introduction. Um, Thanks. Thank you. Um, so let's let's just jump right in. The The main subject of the, the conversation is, uh, you know, great. Uh, how, how, how is that going to get done? Um, so uh, emergence benefactors, which maybe we could talk a little bit more about the end, um, give anyone who happens to listen to this who has a lot of spare cash lying around, if they want to direct that towards a, a good cause, we can tell them about that uh, later. But um, for now, uh, what what in practice in the in the research will this actually look like? And the structure for the conversation uh, I had envisioned is just going kind of point by point at the, the projects that are outlined in the, uh, the EPRC white paper. Um, which I'll link to uh, in the description uh, when this when this gets posted. Uh, so starting off uh, at the top, uh, what about what is the the phenomenology project, um, and what what is that all about? You've used the word uh, phenomenology a lot, but maybe maybe some people watching this, what what do we mean by phenomenology? 
Yeah, so phenomenology has this long history that goes back to obviously ancient descriptors of meditation stuff, like and you find in these books like Vasudhimaga and Vimudhimaga and old commentarial texts and lots of other religious traditions as well, describe the experiences that people had. And I'm going to back up just a second to sort of define what I mean by the word emergence. So I'm going to use this word emergence a lot. And emergence is the term we're currently using for what most people would call spiritual, mystical, magical, inner energetic, um, psychedelic phenomena, and particularly those phenomena that seem to have some impact, that seem to change or do something, that seem to have some sort of functionality to them in terms of life trajectory or you know, capabilities, be it pro or con or up or down or, or just sideways or strange or different. And so we use it to describe the whole range of highs, lows, and weirds, essentially wanted, unwanted, and I don't know, that was sort of curious, I don't know if I wanted that or not. Um, and th that's a huge range of things, and we mean everything from just basic sensate experiences to paradigmatic and existential transformations, and everything in between movements and lights and uh, sounds and entities and capabilities, st you know, both states and stages and traits and yeah, capabilities and all the psychological impact of that, good, bad, or unusual. And uh, then a sense of how this unfolds over time. So this is, these are the emergent phenomena that we're concerned with. And so the phenomenology project is the kind of the foundation of what we are trying to do. And I'm going to go back to just use a clinical example to try to explain what I mean. So as a clinician in the ER, I saw a lot of people with migraine headaches. It's a pretty common thing, and yet they're pretty weird. They can do a lot of very strange things, like the standard migraine of, oh, I have a pain here and it's making me nauseous and want to lie in the dark. Cool. But there are also these things called auras. or not cool, actually terrible, but, um, but understandable. Okay, got that. But then there's all this other strange stuff that can do. Like a, a classic one I, I've described in a lot of these podcasts, and, and, and it's a really good example, is someone seeing a bunch of wavy white lines. This is a really classic migraine kind of thing for someone to have. And it's one of the things that helps. Oh, you have this. I, I, I have only experienced it once, but I know exactly what you're talking about. It began, I was reading a book, and suddenly there was like a blind spot where there, there wasn't before. And then radiating white lines and zigzags yeah. started to pass over my visual field. And I was like, at first I was like, what, what is that? Have I, you know, and weird, weird things happen in my perception. So I was like, is that one? No. Okay. Migraine. Oh, migraine. But it was yeah. weird. It was bizarre. Totally bizarre. Right. And this is a phenomenological thing that you can describe. And so phenomenology is going to be the first basis of this because we have no way to measure these white lines. There's no instrument or scanner I can put you in, or maybe there is, I don't know. But if there is, I don't know about it. They can see these white lines. Maybe if you have very fine grained fMRI looking at the optical cortex or something, you'd get, um, you know, you'd get something that you could see, you know, changing if you had fine enough resolution, maybe. Um, but so this is based on people's subjective experience, but it's very helpful for us from a clinical point of view. And um, and what's interesting about that also, one of the things is also the, the, the basic underlying ethics or sort of aesthetics of this project, not only ethics, but also aesthetics, is something we think of as ontological neutrality or ontological agnosticism. So from a clinical pragmatic point of view, I never asked myself the question, are these lines real or not real? Like it, it doesn't apply. What, the, what was, was more interesting to me is, do these help me differentiate migraines from something else that's going on? Do, me help, do they help predict something in the clinical course? Is this familiar to the patient? Do they need reassurance and normalization? Do I need to get a CT or an MRI of their head? Do I need to do some other testing? Or can I go, wait a second, this is classic wiggly migraine lines, and this just screams migraine to me. I can be relatively confident this is a migraine without being one more reinforcing bit of clinical symptomatic data that can help me maybe avoid unnecessary imaging, radiation exposure, expense time, and, and just help this person to do better from a clinical outcomes point of view. And so it's that kind of phenomenological, symptomatological for things that people don't like, and also just sort of opportunities for people, things that people do like, of describing phenomenology. You can say, hey, I saw a bunch of wiggly white lines around this black spot. Okay, cool. That's phenomenology. It's very descriptive. It's very straightforward. It's very first person. And it's the kind of thing that really a person has to tell you. And that's the first person part. And the, so the phenomenology project is about just first 
a catalog of what is the range of emergent phenomenology? What are the range across psychedelic experiences of these effects? What is the range from the meditative literature? What is the range of what people describe today? And so first, just starting with that as like a large basket, very much in the tradition of the naturalists, the naturalist wandered out into the jungles and oceans and, and forests and, and deserts of the world, and they, et cetera, and they, they saw what was there. And they just wrote down, oh, this bug has three red dots, and it's got this many antennae, and it seems to look like this other bug, and maybe it's related, I don't know, maybe they're mimics. And, and they, they began to develop this massive catalog of all of these things. And then by having the catalog and having the language to describe the catalog, they could then begin to relate things in the catalog to each other oh, this lizard lives by eating these bugs that then gives rise to this thing, which is, you know, part of, and then they could start to see defined cycles and ecosystems and life cycles. And, oh, this is actually just the, the larval stage of this thing. And then it become, you know, goes through metamorphosis into that thing. And, the, you know, they could start to, to get a sense of what was really going on. So the phenomenology is that naturalistic description based on old texts and contemporary reports and current texts and all kinds of sources of just what is the range and, and then start to figure out through things like the taxonomy subproject, how do these things relate to each other? And hopefully coming up with taxonomic categorizations that have some underlying physiological mechanism to them. One of the things we're going to talk about is sort of this rough clinical perennialism or physiological perennialism. Like if you're seeing bright wiggly lines, you know, or there's probably only so many pathways or options by which that could actually happen on a neurological basis. Not that the meat brain and all of our neurology is necessarily the whole picture, but it's certainly an important part of the picture. That, that part is, is clear. And so this coming up with taxonomies that then have some sort of clinical, pragmatic, functional utility such that they can help people identify things in a functional way. And then not only just sort of static taxonomies of things that may be related based on biochemistry or underlying physiology or how they kind of come as a package, how like, oh, when you see, you know, this, you might be likely to see that in the same way with migraines. When you see the, you know, the ziggly white lines, maybe you also have some nausea and a headache and want to lie in the dark. And we can then identify this as a syndromic cluster that then may have some clinical meaning, right? And so, and the same with the positivist things as well. When you feel the, the white shuddering light up your spine, maybe you're also more likely to feel divine bliss and a sense of profound insights into the nature of the universe or something, right? So you can start to identify these kinds of patterns of things, not only as, as individual elements, but as they tend to arise collectively in mean, potentially meaningful packages that have some outcome, you know, predictive or prescriptive uh, you know, or, you know, developmental, maybe you can do something cool with that. If you tune into this aspect of it, maybe it does that and you tune into that aspect, maybe it does this, right? Optionality, right? Which is really important. Um, but then also the sense of development, almost like embryology, like, oh, if you saw this thing, you're likely to see this thing next. And th this is something to either watch out for or feel as an opportunity or be expecting or be working towards possibly based on certain techniques, which we'll get to when we get to the practice project. So that's really the goal of the phenomenology project. Thoughts or questions? Um, maybe, maybe just a reflective summary to make sure that... Uh... I've, I've understood. So there's this huge territory of contemplative psychedelic emergent, you know, we'll, we'll use the term emergent phenomena, um, which uh, are rather understudied and, uh, or there are classification systems, but often those classification systems are made without adequate sampling of the incredibly broad array of experiences. And so, you know, first off, to actually make taxonomies, and then do useful research, you actually have to go out there and look, if, if you like, or talk to the people who have gone out there and looked, um, and then make your research classifications, taxonomies, relationships, causal reasoning from that actual broad evidence base, which just doesn't exist as of yet in an organized form. Is that right? And it also doesn't exist um, in a way that is not bound up in specific orthodox interpretations. So the, the traditions that we all have come from in this business have done a lot of them tremendously useful work in terms of grouping things together and also often giving them interpretive meaning, um, highlighting things about their potential progressive nature, et cetera. But nearly all of them have small to medium to sometimes very large 
elements of some hyperbole or exaggeration or um, interpretive frameworks that may not scale globally. So one of the critical components of the EPRC is ethics, which involves patient autonomy, beneficence, non-malfeasance, and justice and equity. And the justice and equity part means that we want things that scale globally in the same way that just calling, you know, an our, you know, an atom with six protons in it carbon, right? In that same kind of way, we would like for meditative or, you know, emergent psychedelic prayer based whatever um phenomenology and so uh, most of the uh, basically all of the traditions have language that is likely and or interpretations that is likely to exclude them from what is likely to scale and meet the needs of people who just want something very neutral and descriptive that could easily fit into their culture and allow their own interpretive and cultural overlay to not be interfered with and instead just be something descriptive and helpful in the same way that like appendicitis isn't political or bound up in orthodoxies or religious stuff. It's just a thing. Migraines generally aren't either. And these are just more things that occur. And so uh, these are the sorts of things that that's the sort of attitude we hope to go into this with to come up with the language to describe these taxonomies that also has that global scalability, that clinical neutrality, such that we can re reach people everywhere to benefit from this work equally. Excellent. Uh, yeah. I mean, sounds great. Thank you. You should, you, you should fund this if you're listening. Yeah, that's also true. Yes, yeah. If you if you want this to exist in the world, uh, this is going to take hundreds of millions, and so uh, we are happy to to uh, benefit from. We bring the team, the plan, the expertise, the organization, the whatever, and you can um, bring your contribution, which would be some of the funding, sure, or your expertise, or your networks, or your ideas, or your talents, and and capabilities, your institutions, please. We're also interested in all of that as well, obviously. this is It takes all of those things to accomplish this, um, a tremendous amount of diversity of cultural expertise. Uh, and so to, to figure out how in the world this will scale globally, which is our primary aim. So yeah, it takes all of those kinds of resources. If you have any of those, please feel free to lend them. And I'll put contact info for all of this. Yeah, uh, thank you. All of this below. Um, okay, I think we've covered the phenomenology pro project, a kind of sketch. What is the, the state of the art project? So the state of the art project is really looking at what has already been done, because what has already been done is vast and massive and goes back thousands of years across diverse languages, literatures, cultures, and extending forward to today. So I have, I don't know how many hundreds of books on these topics on my shelves, and there are countless tens of thousands more that exist in, in contemporary culture across all these traditions of people trying to figure out how what can happen, what does it mean, what's how do we group it, how do we think about something in its progressive nature, what are the best ways to relate to it, how do we cultivate the effects that people may want, how do we mitigate the effects that people may not want, how do we, we relate skillfully to the changes that can um, come in us as our paradigms shift, uh, and what are reasonable ways to describe and talk about all of this. So, you know, this is, has been in the business of the mystical, magical, spiritual, energetic, psychedelic traditions across the globe. And so uh, an amazing amount of work has already been done. And to make sure that we properly honor that, that we don't just reinvent the wheel when we don't need to, that we're not missing incredibly useful work that brilliant, dedicated people have already done and sometimes gone to great lengths to make sure we have today. So some of these old, you know, texts right here, you know, these were copied on palm leaves and things is one of many examples of, of traditions that have brought stuff forward to us, you know, for, for thousands of years. And that's why we have them today. And obviously they, they found some extreme value in them, or they wouldn't have dedicated those time, the types of uh, scribe resources, et cetera, to these projects. And consequently, there is likely a tremendous amount that is valuable to us today. So the state of the art project wants to make sure we have done our due diligence, and that's a tall order, given the vast body of the literature, to make sure that we are um, building on the foundations that have already been created for us and honoring those and not spending needless resources reinventing things that have already been done just fine already. Like we, we didn't need to spend money on that. They've already done that great. That's excellent. That works. That scales. It's solid. It has decent evidence quality. But then also making sure we identify the problems and the gaps and the discrepancies, right? Because the arguments between the traditions are, are also legion. And 
to make sure that we appreciate the evidential quality. So epistemologically, in order for things to scale into the global scientific clinical public mainstream, they may need different types of evidence, like prospective randomized controlled comparative trials, for example. They may, may need neuroimaging. They may need um, some, you know, psychological development scales that have been well validated in other contexts applied to people's claims to whatever is going on with them. They, they may, need, may need all kinds of other things to meet the epistemological needs, the, the how do we know this needs of the current era that we find ourselves in. And so, um, and also to, to take the great controversies, which some, some are new, some are old, some are, you know, per, almost seemingly as perennial as wisdom, and, and to figure out what can science that is very neutral and objective and not coming from a specific tradition or agenda, but just trying to figure out what helps, what scales, what works, and what correlates with other things that we know about biochemistry, et cetera. And to come to look at the, the, what's already been done, the state of the art, through that lens and say, okay, here are the things we really do need to answer because there's honest controversy here between well-meaning people who have you know, large amounts of the case series that they've been exposed to in decades in this or centuries or millennia. And this is just something that we need to, to really lend another way through biostatistical methods, through imaging methods, through AI methods, through you know, Bayesian, Bayesian methods or frequentist methods. And you know, and trials, and really think about confounding and all the biases, right? Because we have a, a vastly greater appreciation of things like yeah, bias and study design than any previous era did. And so we can take those tools and hopefully, in a very thoughtful way, um, that isn't coming from an ontological lens like you know, material primacy or even consciousness primacy or any of these things, and instead just says what what is this that people describe and thinking very carefully about that. So that's the, the other thing the state of the art project needs to do. And it will form the basis of a lot of research questions going forward as we try to fill in the gaps in the traditions and resolve controversies and confirm things that may have already been demonstrated in massive case series of people doing you know intensive monastic practice for thousands of years or whatever, and say, really? Okay, maybe. Cool. They've got a good basis of evidence. Can we take it to the next level of evidential quality that the clinical mainstream appreciates much more than they do what currently exists. Yeah, that's uh, that's decades of rigorous scholarly research. <laughs> yep, that's decades, and that's a whole <laughs> lot of money to do it properly and to do it robustly, right? Because a lot of people do small studies. It's been very hard to find money for this stuff, but I actually think that these practices and these experiences are scaling so rapidly. We have to do this. We have to do this. And if we do do this, it will be basically era-changing, it will because just as you know, we went from you know in the, in the West, for example, from the Renaissance, you know, from the medieval period into the Renaissance, into the you know modernity and the late modernity and post modernity, each of those involves a fundamental shift between religion, science, public knowledge, culture, economics, um, social justice. And, and this is very much a social justice issue because people who are having these experiences, clearly the clinical mainstream and the mental health world and even the public don't have anything like enough data to really treat these people properly and to relate as skillfully as we know can happen to these kinds of phenomena. And this will, this will be the same kind of fundamental structural paradigmatic upgrade. Uh, and the fact that you might be able to do that for 500 million or something dollars is, is kind of amazing that literally a single billionaire at this point could fund era change in a very positive and meaningful way that hopefully just leads to better outcomes. And, you know, the people having these experiences or wanting to have these experiences doing that in a much more safe and effective way. Yeah, yeah. Um, That's maybe, amazing. <laughs> maybe uh, this, this might come up later in one of the projects uh, more than it has already. And if so, we can defer the question that if you could speak a little to the value of destigmatization around, you know, experiences which are outside of, you know, whatever culture you're in, whatever the norms are within that, um, yeah, maybe, maybe I don't know that that was a thought that came up. Yeah, the people, the fact that people with like MD PhDs at literally the best universities in the world cannot talk about the most meaningful and transformative, beneficial and amazing adventures and their deepest truths with their colleagues for fear of losing their funding, their jobs, their positions, their tenure track, whatever, when in theory, these institutions are about the highest knowledge and most benefit to society and you know pushing the envelope. 
that's obviously a serious problem, right? And and that 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 it can't even happen at the highest scales where people are supposed to be the most open to ideas from people at the highest levels of training and thus in theory unbelievability. Um, just think about how that scales down to everybody else, right? Like and and so we have a global situation where the vast majority of my friends who have deep experience in these fields don't teach, don't talk about it, don't talk about it with their friends, don't even have told their families, sometimes even their partners, some of the stuff that's going on with them, that this is all seriously in the closet, you know, and, and, you know, because the clinical mainstream basically has no options unless you use a few modifier codes that almost nobody uses, other than saying this is all crazy and needs meds, which is really currently this, I, I don't mean to be needlessly dismissive of mainstream psychiatry, but that is basically as good as it gets with regard to most of this stuff. Um, and or it's illegal and or it's immoral and or, you, you know, there, there are literally countries where you could still, um, for describing these things, be put on in witch trials and, you know, killed or ran out of town. Um, and so and th that happens also in its less severe forms in workplaces, in families, in religious traditions, even religious traditions that intentionally describe these things as stuff you could cultivate sometimes can get very, very bad reactions. That is obviously an extremely important civil rights issue, social justice issue, and just opportunity missed issue, because as we also know, these experiences can sometimes be incredibly transformative healing, revelatory insights. Going all the way back to Plato, we have this concept of sort of divine madness, where he said basically like, yeah, these people can get pretty nuts, but also some of the absolute best things in the world came out of them, right? Some of the most important things we know or have came out of these people who are clearly a little strange from an ordinary muggleish point of view. And the history of this bears this out. So like everything from Paul and St. Augustine and Rene Descartes and Einstein and T.S. Eliot, and I could just go keep just Tolstoy and just, just keep going down the list of major figures, right? Uh, you know, the prophets that founded all the major religions, the, the Buddha and Muhammad and, you know, all the, you know, Jesus and et cetera and so forth. And, you know, all, all these people who had these, you know, Moses on and on, the people that had these revelatory experiences, all the Hindu you know, people who come up with that mythology, clearly they were having these kinds of experiences. And, and these have been some of the most sometimes beneficial, you know, moral, uh, uh, be, you know, useful organizations in the entire world. Not that a staggering amount of bad hasn't also come out of religions and wars and stuff. It also has, but then even dealing with that dark side of these strange things, right? That's an important how what are the most skillful ways to deal with the darkness and the weird and the crazy and the dysfunction and get the benefits of the openness and the healing and the paradigm expansion and the radical transformations to self and other and the deepest of existential questions and the, all of that and and that i think is something that science could lend something to if not sort of filtered and co-opted by either the pharmaceutical industry or you know the the sort of the science scientist scientific materialists and and all of that, nor, you know, artificially co-opted by the specific orthodox religious traditions to bend it to their political power and recruiting purposes, right? So I think there is a way to scale this globally that is just very straightforward, because I've seen that in my own life and among my friend group, there are people who can do this and come at this with that kind of paradigm, and that only a few people have access to that, we think the globe should have access to that, because it's clearly better. Yeah, it's a uh threading the needle but it, it really really can be done for sure yeah i think it can be done and i think it can be done in this era and with current technology and that it can be scaled perhaps yes. most importantly yeah and yeah. and i think also now we have the anthropological sensitivity the cultural sensitivity the linguistic sensitivity to really figure out how um, rather than doing what the colonialists did, right? So because scaling could have the sort of, ooh, colonial scaling, the more, you know, rich white people or something imposing their will on the rest of the planet um, in the same kind of way that getting people good migraine treatments is a good idea of whatever culture you're in. Um, but you can figure out how you describe that, how you talk about it, what beliefs you add, add on to it, fine. But there is some underlying benefit that can occur from these sorts of things. That's what we're looking for. I mean, all, all, all to the good. I, no, no, no questions or, or qualms there. Um, uh, the neurophenomenology project. Yeah, so neuro, neurophenomenology came to us through a, a bunch of people and was then amplified by Varela, and is the notion of 
using first person reports to correlate with objective measurement of fMRI, EEG, um, MEG, there's a number of other imaging modalities, but the essential thing is that you're being scanned or you're like, you know, you're in the scanner and you're clicking buttons when you shift into different states and you describe, okay, now I'm experiencing this. Now my mind is doing that. Attention is doing this. The sense doors are like this. These are, this is what the thoughts are doing. This is what the emotions are doing. And you begin to see, are these measurable correlates of what people are experiencing? And the, the unique thing about our age is we now have machines that can begin to measure meditative states and differentiate them from other things and say, hey, this really is increasing this sort of connectivity or decreasing this connectivity or activating the default mode network or deactivating it or causing increased frontal executive function or something in the temporal lobes related to the perception of God or whatever it is, right? The God helmet. There's there's all these things and you can start this to, to go, wait a second. Now, for the first time in history, we can actually measure this in the way that meets the needs of the people who like the work of Galileo and Newton and the materialists who said, if you can't measure it, it isn't real. And, you know, the logical positivists, et cetera. And now we can actually measure some of this stuff. And you really can. I mean, I've been in fMRI a bunch of times and EEG and half my own home EEG. And, and you can start to really notice obvious patterns as I click through states and stages. And it's definitely like the alpha suppression and the sudden, you know, synchronies of this and increased beta and gamma activity. And all of a sudden, you know, the theta and the delta are coming up or whatever. And it just happens in predictable patterns and correlates. So it's very exciting. And now we're, we have, for example, an ongoing study at Harvard where we're doing fMRI and EEG of advanced meditators going into meditative states and stages and seeing how their descriptions and their button pushes may or may correlate with observable brain structures and starting to get a sense of, hey, to what degree is this universal? To what degree are there variants, right? Because our brains are not all exactly built the same way. The centers are not all the same shape. We don't even have all the same numbers of centers, right? Sort of the sort of, uni you know, so our brains are not all wired the same, but there may be some correlations and some differences and looking at what are the correlations and differences across practitioners and across different descriptions and starting to build up a big catalog of that. And we're not the first to have done this, obviously. Um, this really started uh, with meditators with Sarah Lazar in 2005, a landmark study. And actually, we would love to fund some of her next research. So we would love to find uh, $7.2 million to get her to her next level of research and help fund her at Martinez Imaging Center, which is where they invented fMRI, and to help the other people um, in that space to do what they do really well and take us to next levels of scientific advancement. I mean, may, may it be so. That's, that's yes, all I can say. <laughs> absolutely. And to help uh, these brilliant people help all of us to understand this stuff better. Yeah. Um, the Theoretical Foundations Project. Yeah. One of the things we began to realize is even if we had this sense that, of course, phenomenology and microphenomenology and Husserl and uh, Claire petit Mangin and clinical symptomatology and all of these things, of course, they're all kind of the same thing to us. And, you know, Varela and neurophenomenology and all these things. It turns out from a sort of an academic theoretical point of view and, and even just like, can you look at old texts? Like, you know, one of the projects I want to fund is this guy, uh, Dr. C. Pierce Salguero um, with Penn State and related to Johns Hopkins, who wants to, to look at all these Chinese medical texts that were describing qi sickness or meditation sickness, basically all the strange stuff that can go wrong. And apparently there's this massive literature on this in, in classical medieval uh, Chinese that has never been translated to English and never really analyzed for what's medically useful about this, right? So it's interesting. I was reading this Egyptian manual of like how you treat wounds, and they were talking about treating them with honey and olive oil to prevent infection, basically. And actually, it turns out honey is a very good anti-infective. Like it's just, it turns out it works as well on modern burns as any of the other things you put on burns like that, that are expensive and derived in some lab or whatever, you can just put honey and it works as well. It's kind of sticky, but you know, like it's, it's anti-infective properties is just as good. And, and it's interesting there, there's, there was this sense in the translation of ancient text things that, oh no, they don't touch medical stuff or really think of it in real clinical terms when actually there might be really useful clinical knowledge there for hundreds and hundreds of years, people have come up with cool things that actually work, right? The smallpox vaccine where you take cowpox and whatever that was hundreds of years ago, and it still works. So you know, there, and so apparently that these fields didn't really all get along and actually actively sometimes are kind of 
uh, like antithetical to or hostile to or dismissive of or oh no we don't go there that's outside of our lane outside of our box like no 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 we're just this and and so trying to figure out the theoretical foundations of so can you write thoughtful papers that can bring the fields together and help the mis multidisciplinary approach and the talents that everybody brings lead to much richer and more robust findings that really help people. And so the theoretical foundations project is building those conceptual um, bridges, the literature bridges, the breaking down the artificial what I or what I at least think of perhaps slightly disrespectfully for whatever reason they constructed these barriers. But what I think of and we think of as artificial barriers between these fields that we think should get all along and currently don't as well as we think is needed to allow everybody's talents to really come into play to move this project forward to next levels of excellence. Yeah, I mean, this this touches on areas which are perhaps beyond the scope of the conversation, but you know, current yeah. incentive structures within academia, encouraging specialization, competitive publication, you know, not and not as much collaboration and multidisciplinary teams of researchers doing actually valuable work, uh, which, yeah. <laughs> but, I suppose Huge, that's beyond. actually yeah. that, no that's actually one of the key points because as we start to get into this again and i'm getting going to mention these kinds of barriers and one of the things we hope to do with emergence benefactors is if someone would be so kind enough to give us enough resources that we could bring teams together that ordinarily wouldn't collaborate bring people together share data across projects in a way that competition does not lend itself to but open well-funded science does because if you remove the sense of competition, everybody needing to scramble for scarce resources, we are quite sure we will get levels of flourishing and cooperation that just allows for vastly better science as people aren't protective and hoarding of their data sets, but instead very willing to share them such that the whole field moves forward because people can actually, you know, expect to be eating in three years. And like, you know, because the, the constant cycle of being on the grant wheel of, oh, I've got to, I've got to, it makes people super competitive because they know they're competing for scarce money and it makes people very uh, and the, and and you all these academics like there's a lot of people in the EPRC that didn't know each other and I was like how do you not know each other there's only 20 people in your field like like you know like you could meet each other all in a day and be, you become friends and yet they, they they hadn't connected because there's a sense of sort of walled isolation and or competition that is just toxic and so one of the things we hope is that if someone would be so kind enough to give us the resources to bring people together to allow these naturally creative inspired people who went into this because they care about it to spend more time doing the science that they love and the collaboration that is so nourishing and enriching for everyone rather than scrambling on the grant treadmill. Death to publish or perish, I suppose. <laughs> well, it's not like we don't want these people to publish. Of course we do. That's part of the point. But to, to feel nourished in that publishing, to change something in the game theory and incentive structures, the culture, the vibe. And yeah, that's, that's vital, we think, for making this project be all it can be. Yeah, ma massive coordination problems, which, uh, you know, a, a funding organizations such as the EPRC hopefully will intervene in. Absolutely. Yeah, that's part of the dream. And we'll yeah. see if we can encourage someone to help uh, this uh, work out. Awesome. Um, the underlying physiology project. Yeah, it's this notion that obviously there's this sort of weird thing of like, is meat brain consciousness and how does meat brain correlate with experience? But, you know, there clearly are physiological effects. You could push phenobarbital into people and their consciousness just stops, right? They just <laughs> fall asleep, right? So there is, there is this sort of meat brain aspect to what we do. You can give people a psychedelic and suddenly their consciousness is very different. You can look at serotonergic and dopaminergic and norepi and epi and uh, all kinds of other transmitters and pathways and, you know, things about sodium and potassium, like apparently one of the more common causes of people on meditation retreats to freak out is actually just good old hyponatremia because they're eating and drinking. They're, they're not drinking as much as they normally would. And they're, they, they, you know, the different salt intake and whatever it is. And so like there are these physiological things that impact what people are experiencing and vice versa. And a lot of these are measurable. 
it turns out with current neuroimaging, these things are measurable. And so making sure we have a sense of what is the underlying physiology of these experiences to the degree that we can measure them. And like, what's the, you know, Kundalini stuff, what is the underlying physio physiology of that? People have been have picking away at that project a little bit here and there, but not on anything like the kind of scale we need to, to help unpack why do sudden people suddenly feel like a big you know, shaking snake of buzzy energy is in their spine, making them wiggle around, you know, like a marionette. What the, what the hell is that? We, we don't know. And we would love to know because something's going on and it's got to have neurological correlates. There's just no way this isn't using your nervous system, regardless of what else might be going on in the energetic plane or whatever you want to hypothesize. And at least the, there are portions of it that should be measurable. And so those are the kinds of things we want to measure to understand the biochemistry, to understand the role of pharmaceuticals, what, you know, what does happen when someone's having a massive opening and you give them, a, a, you know, one of the antipsychotic drugs, does it help them just not be so crazy or does it block some developmental process that really needed to move through? Well, these are competing hypotheses that have an underlying physiological component that our guess is should be measurable. What is the role of epigenetics, by the way, in this? And genetics, one of the most interesting things is why do some people, the wind blows and they start, their consciousness starts opening and other people, they literally go on years of retreats and it stays at the level of psychology and back pain and they never have any of this stuff. What is up with that? Why does it seem to run in families? A lot of people, oh yeah, my mom and parents were this way they're also weirdos and they have this stuff like what is up with that to what degree is this genetic and epigenetic to what is degree is it nurture and nature what yeah pharmaceuticals um the impact of psychedelics which ones did are they making you more prone to magical experiences or less right so like the curious thing of marijuana what's up with the cannabinoid system and why is it that people just stop dreaming when they start smoking a lot of pot and then they stop smoking a lot of pot and start having all these dreams again something's going on there what is that are you becoming numbed down to your own receptors by you know taking pharmaceuticals or do they actually help open people up to some of the stuff the number of people i've talked to who said psychedelics opened them up to these experiences and all of a sudden they were having seeing auras and whatever you know but also there's this funny phenomenon like if you take lsd one day and then you take it the next day the second day it just doesn't do nearly as much are you dumbing down your own magical receptors to getting into emergent territory and what are the what are the um, dynamics of that how does that go up and down these are questions that we just don't have excellent answers for and we would love them also you know and then this this really relates to things like um what are the other conditions that already have an emergent component like migraines is the wiggly lines you seeing some energetic thing that might be looked at through some sort of emergent lens in some kind of beneficial way because i know some people who had their migraines you know goenka the classic story who went on meditation retreat and his migraines were cured apparently um, although the Buddha apparently had migraines. So like it doesn't, why does it work for some people and not for others? What's, how does this relate to conditions we already know about? Like spasmodic torticollis, how does that relate to Kundalini stuff? TMJ stuff and the number of meditators that are like day three or four of a retreat start getting into TMJ and spasmodic torticollis and they're like, oh, what the hell? Like, and it almost looks like tardive dyskinesia sometimes and these weird echesthesias. Like how, how are the underlying pathways sort of the same between things we already know, exploding head syndrome, well described in the medical literature already they didn't know what the hell it was it looks exactly like a whole bunch of classic kundalini openings how are there these things similar different where do they overlap what do we know about that so that these are some of the critical questions that we want to answer to help just move the field forward so uh to, to summarize we you know as a species we share a broad base of of, of physiology we have all yeah. of these experiences there's, there's got to be a lot of common ground here and patterns sure. that we can notice that we can study. And for those of us who have had a lot of these experiences and or intentionally pursue them, we want to know what, what's, what, what is going on. What is this? What the heck? <laughs> yeah. Inquiring minds want to know. I want to know. Yeah. I want to yeah, know. So. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, the predisposing factors project. Yeah. That's, that's actually what I was just sort of leading up to is why, why do some people they're extremely prone to these experiences and why not, some not? Why do some people have an incredibly hard time and some people don't? Why do some people, the dark sides of the past seem to just pass them by and they just, they drift into pleasant states and they start healing and, and all this and other people, they get into this territory and it's challenging and difficult and anxious and depressing, psychotic. What, you know, what is the role of, of trauma in this? What is the role of nurture and nature? What is the role of genetics? What is the role of even the underlying frameworks you give people? Is it true that people who 
don't have the maps or more intuitive and deeper, faster practitioners, or if you give them the maps and tell them about all the technical stuff, which are the people that are more likely to thrive in that environment rather than the people that just get all competitive and analytical and it totally derails their practice. So what are the predisposing factors that make this more likely to happen? What's the role of mental illness? So should people with bipolar disorder go on, or you know, so-called so bipolar disorders diagnosed by a DSM criteria, should they be going on intensive meditation retreats or not? Is that a predisposing factor that makes them more or less likely to have bad outcomes? Should people with schizoph you know, diagnosed by the DSM as schizophrenia, for example, um, should they be meditating? And if so, on what objects? Should they be doing visualizations and, and mantras, which may make the voices stronger? Or is that a way to go sort of through and heal and integrate those voices? These are So what are the predisposing factors to good outcomes, basically, and bad outcomes? And then knowing that, how can you give people informed consent? Because one of the critical ethical components of this is informed consent, right? So patient autonomy or practitioner autonomy, just personal autonomy in general, is based on informed consent. And informed consent is based on high quality data-driven conversations about the risks, benefits, and alternatives. And what if we could say to somebody, we know based on the data, that based on your predisposing factors going into this, these are the techniques that are likely to be highly effective. These are the techniques that are likely to be highly problematic. And we, we have very good, big, robust data that shows this is likely the most effective use of your time, how to avoid trouble, how to maximize things. And so for all you brain hackers out there, we don't have this data. We have a whole lot of traditions of saying we're the best, right? When from a, like, I would bet that none of them are the best, but some fusion of them tailored to your predisposing factors, your underlying physiology, and that kind of boutique medicine approach of like, who are you and what does this do for you? And how does the, the how do the averages interface with your specific case. That's what the predisposing factors project is all about and doing that science. Yeah. Yeah. I, in a conversation with a Marchin, a member of the EPRC the other day, the, the phrase, uh, and you know, this may turn some people off, but comparative contemplative optimization might be a way to describe the project. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's going to be threatening for some people, but even with various traditions, right? So is, is prayer, which you find in basically all traditions, right? Is that going to be most useful? Is cognitive restructuring, which some variant of you find in all the traditions going to be most useful? What are the, you know, how does trauma play into this? You know, like trauma-sensitive mindfulness-based perspectives like David Trelave and Willoughby Britton's work, right? Where they're questioning, should you actually be looking down into the body, into the centers where you find fear and where your, your body kept the score? These are critical questions. And, or if you're going to do that, what are the techniques that are most likely to have you not get you know, destabilized or get out of your tolerance range and instead most likely to lead to rapid healing. And what are the predisposing factors for that based on other things? Um, again, genetics, family history, like, you know, what are the roles of these things? And so, yeah, that's, those are some of the other key questions we hope to solve by good science and good data done in a really tradition neutral way, right? That really is just willing to be open and not be all rah, rah team, but really, hey, this is good. This is bad. This is weird. And this is in what cases we know that. And, and all of this coming from a place of, of care, compassion, and a wish for better outcomes for all. Absolutely. Yep. yep. And more empowerment and knowledge. Yeah. Empowering the healthcare system, empowering the mental health system, empowering social workers, empowering practitioners, empowering people who, religious leaders, meditation teachers, you know, uh, shamans in the jungle, you know, I guess shamans technically would be out in somewhere in Siberia, but, you know, we, shaman in the sort of colloquial sense, apologies for any cultural insensitivity there. And uh, so, you know, ayahuascaros and everybody just to do what they do better and to have people have more of a common language that they can communicate, share with each other and grow from each other and learn from all this collective wisdom that people have been working on in these little siloed ways, but really haven't gotten some of this cool tech out to other people that really could benefit what everybody is doing. Yeah, thanks. Um, the Diagnosis Project. Yeah, so the Diagnosis Project is for this is clearly looking at things that are pathological and or unwanted as contrasted with the practice project, which is cultivating things that people want to have. So the diagnosis project is looking through a, a little, we're getting a little more medical and clinical at this point and saying, hey, if, if someone's suddenly like having some experience that is challenging them or making a present to a mental health practitioner or something, then 
how do we put that into meaningful categories that then lead clearly to management strategies? Because the first point of diagnosis is normalization. Like if someone said, you have an ear infection, we can see it, that's why your ear hurts, right? That's the first thing. Okay, thanks. Now I have an explanation for why my ear hurts. You can see a, a dull membrane with pus behind it. Okay, great. Then the next thing that hopefully leads to is the questions of management, because the most useful diagnostic categories are, oh, you got this thing. We don't know what to do for it. Have a nice day. But so it's not only normalizing for people, validating of the experience, which in, in itself can be incredibly healing. People are incredibly relieved by diagnoses, even bad ones. Like the God, I knew something was going on in my stuff. It's just something. It's been two months now. And yeah, I'm sorry, that's the pancreatic cancer you have, which is a death sentence, that is incredibly challenging. Like, I'm sorry, I just had to tell you a horrible thing, right? That sucks, right? Heavy. And yet there's this weird relief that people get too, even if it's a terminal disease, right? They go, oh my God, well, at least I've got an answer. Now I can make my plans. I can tell my family. I'm like, okay, well, I thought it was just, you know, I was taking all these Tums or whatever and it wasn't working. Now, or, and maybe you can do something about it. Maybe you can do a surgery or chemo or whatever you do for the you know, cancer, obviously, or alternative treatment modalities. That's a whole nother conversation that I want to get into. But at least you have an answer. And in the same kind of way, diagnosis can be incredibly relieving to people. So it has its own merits. But then hopefully you also go, by the way, not only can we diagnose this, but it helps differentiate what we do next, right? We know that if this is causing it, we can do this. If this is and then we can help, it'll help guide management strategies and a conversation about management strategies. Like we know people with ear infections, most will get better without antibiotics, but we can give you antibiotics. And if we give you antibiotics, it might cause increased resistance as well as some clostridium difficile diarrhea. And there's a possible chance of allergic reaction and or some other rare side effects. Um, but we also know that if we give you the antibiotic and some people, it might help prevent a little bit of mastoiditis. And then we can have an intelligent conversation based on that diagnosis with somebody to help preserve maximum autonomy and help they bring them up to an understanding that really brings them into the decision-making process as much as possible. Right. And at present, for many people uh, seeking emergent experiences or who just have them spontaneously, they're kind of either left in the dark or they're in a siloed tradition where there is a, a set structure which may not actually fit their particular needs, their Right. Yeah, it's like psychological, emotional, contemplative, developmental goals, needs, and complications. And that yes. could it be better. Yes. And yeah. So, so, so the diagnosis project is all about figuring out what are the reasonable diagnostic categories that help differentiate between treatment strategies and help normalize things for people with these experiences. Oh, it also incredibly informs the epidemiology project, which I'll talk about in a second extremely useful for that and the proper ed allocation of healthcare resources. All, all very important. And research uh, resources. Right. I, I, I suppose prioritizing, you know, the, the concern areas uh, first, uh, first and foremost. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, let's see, we just, we just did the diagnosis, the management project. What's yeah, that so the management is, project is all about what do you do? So someone comes to you and let's say they said, oh, doctor, I felt this shuddering white light going up my spine and had this sense of divine bliss and I haven't slept in three days and have been philosophizing like crazy and telling all my friends to meditate and they all now think I'm totally nuts. Um, so, you know, so once we've diagnosed, oh, you're having a whatever we want to call that, right? Currently, you would call it a manic episode with psychotic features if you're using a DSM diagnosis, but somebody else might call it Kundalini awakening and the, you know, and somebody else might call it your rising and passing away and someone else might call it a, a peak experience. And, you know, there's all these things we could call it. But regardless of what you call it, the question is then what do you do? Right. So the management project is do these, does this person want to ground down? Do they want to explore the creative potential? Do they want to whatever? So hopefully, as much as possible, this is driven by the goal of the person who's asking the question or, you know, or who've gotten the diagnosis. And then the intersection of the diagnosis and their goals and available resources and what we know as possible informs management. And then management might be here are grounding techniques, here are conceptual frameworks, here are ways to tune consciousness, 
if it's causing serious trouble and they're like, I just want to shut this down with meds. Here's the medications. And we know what they might do. Their risks and benefits, their addiction potential, their potential to cause metabolic syndromes or tardive dyskinesia or, you know, um, impaired cognition or rebound phenomena or whatever it is we can, or, but they might, you know, make the voices go away and help you get some sleep or what, you know, we can, we can have these informed conversations about what are we now going to do about it? The rubber meets the road. What are we doing? And this is in some ways, one of the core points of the whole project is to get to this level. So once we've got the phenomenology and the taxonomy and the physiology and the diagnosis, then prospectively compared management trials, we can take people and say, hey, here's a bunch of people we manage with non-medication techniques as they're advocated by a bunch of traditions. And here's a bunch of people we just put on antipsychotics and benzos. Let's follow them forward and see what happens, right? Current standard of care versus alternative standard of care and, and maybe something else, right? It's just one of many possible simplifying clinical trials we could do. And then at least we have data that can inform questions, uh, you know, they can answer, sorry, inform when people ask questions of which one should I do, doctor? Well, you can at least tell them. And so the management project is all about answering those kinds of questions. What helps with DPDR? What helps, what helps with people who are getting into, you know, Kundalini gone sideways or whatever you want to call it. You don't have to call it Kundalini. Obviously that language doesn't scale globally. It's just the shorthand I happen to use. And again, we're all coming from our traditional linguistic biases, most of which aren't going to work. And that, that highlights the obvious problem if we need language that is more neutral than what most of us are coming to this with. And that requires very careful, um, conversations with people very globally in the same way that science did, right? Well, so in physics and chemistry and biology were trying to standardize and mathematics were standardizing their terminology. They came together and they had these big conversations about what, what are we going to call stuff? How are we going to notate it? And that's what we need to do globally for these things so that we can come up with reasonable consensus and not just people's individual, you know, favorites. Yeah, because at, at present, there's such a massive translation prog problem that it's it's hard to Huge. even get many of these conversations off the ground. And right. if, if someone uh, runs into this territory unexpectedly or is accelerated into unknown territory, yep. uh, even even if intended, uh, they they ask their teacher or the internet uh, and they have, you know, hundreds of conflicting uh, pieces of advice that they have no way to reasonably discriminate between which is right. a, not a good situation. <laughs> yeah, and we would love to give them the data and, and present it in a really thoughtful, well-done way, robust data that can help them decide. All right. Um, the Epidemiology Project. Yeah, so the Epidemiology Project, we have no idea what the incidence and prevalence of these things are in populations. And because we don't we don't know their impact on on you know quality adjusted life years we don't know their impact on on function we, we don't know the predisposing factors we don't know any of these things there's you know these interesting data like i think it's some is it gallup or pew research that they they did a survey and something like half of you know the people they surveyed had had some kind of mystical spiritual experience 49 percent or something you know and something like 25 percent of americans have seen a ghost like that's a lot of Americans, and I don't know the rest of the world, but you know, that's a lot of people. If it if it translates to other cultures, probably does. And so, and people do meditative and spiritual practices and psychedelics and and all kinds of other things that can get people into these experiences, you know, across the globe. And we don't know the the chances of getting into these experiences if you do these practices. And so we also don't know what kind of trouble these cause. We don't know what kind of healing these cause. To what degree are people just becoming way less anxious and depressed because they're open and expansive and clear and present and able to relate to their thoughts and emotions from this great place of natural unfolding? You know, so we don't we don't have good epidemiology on the bad stuff or the good stuff, right? We, we don't know or the weird stuff that's just kind of like, I don't know, it's kind of strange, but we don't know if it's really good or bad. It's kind of a mixed thing. And we don't have any data on that that's decent. Right? We have a few small studies that have looked at a few practitioners and tried to figure out a few small things, but the, the big questions have not been answered. And so we don't have any way to allocate research or public health dollars, which are obviously scarce. Public health is always underfunded. Research dollars are always scarce to, uh, to figure out, hey, what is the real benefit from these things? Is it true that you can largely cure all your defilements and, and 
bad emotions through deep dive meditative and really changing your experience and and how many people have actually done that what is the cost of doing that what are the benefits and what are the risks and so the epidemiology project is designed to look at these same questions that we focused on in on individuals in populations and to then be able to do population based policy um, that that is based on something rather than just guesswork, because without the diagnostic criteria and then robust robust instruments of diagnosis, be they clinical scales or phenomenological criteria, or outcome whatever it is, measurement, you know, maybe neuroimaging, who knows? We're getting there, I hope. Um, then we have no idea how to 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 get, say where we put our our cash in comparison to cancer and heart disease and gun violence and trauma and and other psychological things and and so you know whatever else infectious diseases obviously a hot topic in the era of coronavirus vaccine research or whatever it is so that's what we need to be able to answer so that this isn't just like the most important thing ever or like totally ignored but instead can be part of a balanced conversation of oh yeah you get this much money because this impact and this consequence and this potential for real um, healing and benefit and transformation of society. You know, and there are a lot of people that think, oh, it's only by everybody getting awakened or having these experiences that we're going to transform society. Well, what percentage already are, because some percentages, how do you move that needle, right? If, if you can't, if your goal would be 30% or 50% or whatever, you don't even know what baseline you're coming from. And so if people have this notion that somehow these things are going to save us all, which might be a perfectly reasonable thing to think, who knows, right? These are going to upgrade society to consciousness 2.0, and we're all going to be happy, loving, compassionate, empty, luminous beings. Then if you don't even know what baseline of that you're starting with, you can't measure, you know, you can't manage what you can't measure. And so you can't like, if you were going to you know, provide resources globally for these kinds of experiences. If you don't even know where you're starting from, you don't know where if you're going or if you're making an impact, you can't assess effectiveness. The effect of altruism movement would obviously be reasonably interested in, okay, how many people have these? Would you do this, spend this much money? What does it do? And is this helping people? And so is that a reasonable thing to spend money on? We don't know because we don't have epidemiology on this. And so, but we need to, right? So this is obviously that this hasn't happened so far is kind of ridiculous, but we're dedicated to making this happen. I'm, as a person who was in a PhD program in epidemiology and bailed with the two-year MSPH, I've been dreaming of this for decades. And so I'm super excited that we might actually have the potential to do this now. It seems decades too late, but okay, still, we're trying. I mean, that's 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 all we can do. And yeah, I hope, yeah. I mean, I... I, I have I have my own uh, hedged bets uh, regarding the subject, but we won't really know until we we do the research. Uh, right. But there is the potential. The emphasis is there is the potential that this is a very high impact area if yeah. you care about things such as the reduction of suffering and the maximization of human fulfillment. If you care about those things, this deserves a lot of attention and, I think and so too. resources. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's been the most tra transformative thing in my entire life, despite all the strange challenges and resource consumption. Um, yeah, there's nothing from my point of view saner that I ever did. And so I'm obviously really excited about these things, recognizing also that they could be very challenging and, um, yeah, problematic also sometimes. So, yeah, uh, all I can say is ditto. Um, let's see the, the practice project. Yeah. So the practice project is kind of the reverse of the diagnosis and management project. It's like how to cultivate the good the things that people want, the desired effects, rather than how to mitigate the bad or the weird effects that people didn't sign up for or don't want, or even if they wanted them as part of the journey, didn't want them to be so hard sometimes, right? Appreciated the challenges and the knowledge of suffering or whatever they gained or the dark night or their journey into the underworld. But uh, did it have to be so hard? The bad trip that, you know, shattered their world and eventually they put it back together in some really new, beautiful, reconfigured way, but ouch. You know, um, so this is the the other side of that coin. This is the how do you, you know, get a sense of what is possible in terms of healing, beneficial states of mind, transformations of consciousness, heart, mind, body, uh, behavior, um, in social interaction, and all of the promises of the spiritual, mystical, magical, energetic, psychedelic paths. How do you optimize for those? What really works? And you know, basically all the traditions say they're the best. It's what traditions do, right? I understand that. I come from a bunch of traditions that all say they are the best, the most pure, the cleanest, the most effective, the highest, the, yeah, okay, I get it. And, and, but 
can they all be? It's like, you know, the number of, it's like what 80 something percent of people think they're above average driver. I don't know the statistic, but you get the idea. They can't all be like only 50% of people are above average drivers, right? So um, then th this is trying to figure out of all of the cool techniques out there that can lead to really beneficial transformations, what can science lend to these in a very comparative way? And say, and even within traditions, people might have a whole range of options of practices they can do, which, you know, if they just want to stay in their tradition, what are the best practices for them in their tradition to really cultivate beneficial effects that to really enhance their own practice and their own healing and their own growth? Um, and so I have this notion based kind of on MMA. So, right, like, so this is an analogy. If you've seen me do podcasts and this, I use this analogy a lot, but, you know, karate and jujitsu and capoeira and whatever, ta Muay Thai and, and all these things, um, uh, you know, um, thought that they were like the best. They were the ultimate fighting style. And what MMA showed is all of them were wrong. All of them had cool elements, but it's only by putting together those in a better way that you got something that really holds up in the ring. And we aim to do the beneficial, nonviolent, hopefully, version of that, which is what are these super cool ways to handle the challenges, to, to, to have the highs lead to the best outcomes without getting totally out of hand and derailing people's lives? What are the, the ways that really lead to dealing with the strange in ways that people like? And then what are the options? Because not everybody has the same goals. Right. So if you say, hey, we know that if you do these techniques, they're likely to lead to these beneficial effects and these these beneficial effects and downsides. So you can have the balanced picture of risk benefits and alternatives, the good, the bad and the strange. And then um, for that people can choose and say, oh, no, this is what I want in my current life situation. I've got you know 2.3 kids and 1.5 jobs and I just can't take a risk of my consciousness doing crazy stuff. But I sure would like to calm down and be, be more present and loving with my family. You know, what is most likely to lead to that? And then other people are like, no, I want to plunge the depths of the deepest whatever. And, and what is the most likely to lead to that? And like, you know, but it's kind of like advanced mountain climbing. You still want to have really good ropes and, you know, safety gear hopefully, or unless you're doing free climbing, in which case that's its whole own thing. But you want to have at least the data if you're doing free climbing on El Capitan or whatever, what are the chances you die? You know, because that's pretty, you know, you either die or don't, you know, so it'd be, be good to have some numbers so you could make informed choices. And uh, this we hope to do for the practice project. Hey, I, I hope I hope it works out. I, I would have liked to, to to have that kind of information. That would have been nice. Me too. Yeah, wouldn't it be great? And I, I would have loved that. So this, we're trying to help next generations to to have something better than what we had coming up. Yeah, uh, the psychedelic project. Yeah, so the psychedelic project is obviously psychedelics are a huge portion of the way that people end up in these experiences. They're weirdly effective in inducing this kind of territory. Um, obviously, in a way that basically nothing else is. Right, you can pretty much guarantee if someone drops 200 mics of acid, they're going to have an altered experience. That's just basically a one to one, perfect, 100. percent You know it. What now? Whether or not it's a good experience, a bad experience, what's the quality of the experience, set and setting, and presupposing factors, and what is the outcomes of that experience? That's a whole other conversation. But they're going to have a weird experience, or an emergent experience, or something, an altered experience is pretty much guaranteed. And so psychedelics are obviously a critical part of this conversation. They have been for millennia. They will be probably for millennia, assuming we don't destroy ourselves as a species. Um, you know, and even dogs lick toads and things, you know, so it's not just our species. Other species seem to go on these journeys as well. And um, so then the, the psychedelic project is very specifically, what is the interface of this particular modality for inducing these experiences and everything else we're doing? Right. But not just having it as as it gets its own special kind of place in some ways, because it's the way the vast majority of people get into this territory. And what are the unique characteristics of psychedelics that are unique only to psychedelics? And then each of the compounds is different. I was super excited to have met Josie Kins, who built Psychonaut Wiki, uh, actually the thing with QRI and you all, like was so excited to meet her and the people who have helped her 
uh, do this as well. I haven't met them yet, but basically mostly her, as far as I understand, and built the subjective effect index of this incredibly neutral, clear clinical technology and terminology of just how do you describe what happens when you take what and for a vast range of compounds in a vast range of doses and wanting to collect data on that. So this is the kind of thing where um, you have excellent citizen science and people trying to figure this out because it's a critical question. What do various psychedelics lead to? Which psychedelic, if you were going to take one, which one you'd take or should you not take one, right? Or, or how would you know? And what do they do? So, the, and how do they re relate to deep spiritual openings and transformations or people getting their consciousness wrecked as, as described from like, you know, the book um, edited by uh, Jules Evans and Tim Reed called Breaking Open, which talks about this or the excellent uh, book, The Wisdom of Mental Illness by Jess Hughes talking about simultaneously profound healings and also profound challenges possible as a result of psychedelics and or meditation. And then how do psychedelics relate to meditative and other non-pharmacological based practices? Practices, non-substance-based practices. This, these are critical questions that are still being answered. What are the same similarities and differences in terms of the, the, the opportunities they offer, the challenges? And this is what the Psychedelic Project does in a, in a very different way of looking at a specific modality and then considering how it interfaces with all the other projects. Incredibly complicated questions uh, and will rely on a wide uh, array of, 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 of expertise, although I yep. think I'm, I'm excited that QRI and the EPRC are, are collaborating and that they're yeah. shared, shared members. That's that's very exciting. As very someone fun who has people a, to work with. Has a, has, a, has a foot in both of these worlds, it's mm -hmm. it's just delightful to, to see it coming together. So. Um, the Mental Health and Emergence Project. Yeah, so obviously this is one of the critical questions. And, you know, where do you draw the line at pathology? What do you, uh, what terms do you use for this? How do we understand the, the diagnostic categories from the DSM-5 or the CCMD-3 or their Latin American equivalents or the other systems that people use in other countries that are sort of, you know, that some national health systems have some of their own criteria. Europe is sort of this weird fusion of things and, and Africa is totally its own thing in Central and South America and even transpersonal literature relating to mental illness very differently than the allopathic, psychiatric, mainstream, APA-based psychological literature. You know, how do you deal, relate mental health and emergence together and focusing on that from all of these points of view? So this is another one of these projects that looks at all the other projects and says, OK, very specific to the topic of what what is the diagnosis of bipolar disorder mean and how does it what are there people who are having emergent phenomena within this or is there some separate thing called bipolar and then there are people who are getting into what I would call the arising and passing away and dark night stuff or whatever you want to call it your your conversion experience and seeing the light and and you know then entering into your own you know phase of being tempted by the devil how, you know all kinds of different ways to look at this thing right and so or is there something that is purely bipolar disorder that has nothing to do with this and it's just totally its own because it has no emergent phenomena or is it there's similar pathways but like it's it's two things that are true true and related in a venn diagram that totally overlaps partially overlaps doesn't overlap at all but has some other intermediary that really just makes it look like there are these similar things or different things you know from an underlying physiology point of view from a pharmacological versus non-pharmacological point of view from a diagnostic criteria point of view, from a diagnostic scales point of view, from an, again, neuroimaging point of view, and from an outcomes point of view, and also from a goals of the patient and maximizing autonomy and beneficence point of view, and from a really informed discussion of risk benefits and alternative point of view, like, can you have an intelligent conversation of if you use a DSM based framework and a, this kind of like standard meds protocol versus an alternative framework? you know, protocol of, let's say you adopted one like the transpersonal literature and you were going to, you know, go to a transpersonal psychotherapist from a specific variant of that, and they were going to do whatever they do. Can you compare these in terms of outcomes such that someone going into this or their family or their guardian or whatever, the police or whatever, the courts, when you end up in these situations, right, where people are having a hard time, um, 
then figuring out which of these frameworks lead to which outcomes. And can you actually compare these two? Because they haven't really done that. As far as I can tell, I don't, if there are studies, I would love to know about them, but I don't know about them that say, if you're going to use a DSM or a CCMD3 or whatever framework, you know, or, you know, ICD-10 and 11 standard billing codes kind of or diagnostic categories versus a transpersonal framework or an, another alternative framework that isn't standard transpersonal or a shamanistic framework, again, losing the, using the term in the, the pop culture, culture sense, not the specific to Mongolia sense or, uh, you know, Siberia. Um, and then, uh, like, what are the, the outcomes? And can we say these, these, you know, so even with regard to underlying conceptual frameworks of what is mental illness, what is psychosis, right? So Brian Spittle's book coming out on Ian Book, Ian Book's very excited about this, which is this 2018 PhD thesis, looking at all of the criteria for psychosis and basically looking at it through a spiritual lens and saying all of these are expected spiritual effects or, or you know, going with a David Lukoff perspective, which is like, no, you can't differentiate you cannot differentiate a, a spiritual opening from mental illness. It's impossible, right? You know, if you adopt each of these lenses, what happens? So you, you know, so rather than saying you must adopt this lens on mental illness or you must adopt this other lens or this diagnostic or management framework, can you compare these in a very just straightforward, neutral way that isn't any of them, that isn't raw rah team, that isn't trying to defend one or the other, but can you just say honestly, what happens if you, if you go to this different types of practitioners and what can they learn from each other? What can they learn from each other? And what can we learn from the controversies between them? And can we have science try to sort out some of those controversies? Like, no, all these people just need antipsychotics and bipolar meds for the rest of their life. They're broken, have a nice day versus no, like some of these people are going to get better and they're fine. You didn't need to give meds and it in fact made it more likely that they're going to stay in the system. All right, so these are honest questions that people, very smart, intelligent, thoughtful people who have seen tons of patients honestly debate. And, and we can say, okay, what is the truth that we, as far as best we can determine it in each of these points of view, so that at least as someone going into this, they can do better at knowing what's what. Yeah, I mean, this this connects uh, quite poignantly to my own personal history. My, my adolescence was basically one long protracted psychiatric crisis, which I could now interpret as, you know, one one long protracted emergent crisis, you, you, you know. Uh, so if if that kind of knowledge had been accessible, boy, uh, I, I might have had an easier time. That would have been nice. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to tell any of that story or no? I've I've told it before on this podcast, Fantastic. though. Okay, though not. I mean, very you know, a sentence or two. Just you know, very protracted, severe, and intense depression with elements of depersonalization, derealization, and uh, openings, which I didn't talk to anyone about because they were weird, uh, mm -hmm. and prescribed medication, and you know, mm. uh, you know, I. Okay. I could have been I could have been better helped. <laughs> yeah. And, and I wasn't. And I'd like other people not to have that kind of experience. And again, I just had the good sense to keep my mouth shut. Yeah. Right? I, I had I, these I, experiences yeah. and just sort of CBT myself into a sense of function in the face of them. Basically totally homebrewed um solutions. But a teenager doing that, you know, a 14 or 15 year old, obviously suboptimal optimal. And I just got really lucky. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't, I, I wasn't, you know, misdiagnosed as psychotic or anything, but like the symptoms d presented as depression, anxiety, uh, and then, because mm -hmm. I wasn't open or honest about what was going on, particularly because yeah. I was afraid, of course. So sure. yeah, that, uh, I wish it had gone better and hopefully it will go better for others. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And, and stories like yours and mine and countless other people, hundreds and thousands I've talked to is the motivation why I volunteer my time for this project and pour my um, financial, temporal, and social capital resources into this project because it's ethically unbelievably compelling. We just have to do this. We just have to do this. Nobody else should have to go through those kinds of things without good data and clinicians that have a much better a level of empowerment to know the range of possibilities of how to help people in this. All right. Um, the anthropology project. Yeah, so this is the critical thing of making sure that we are do our true due diligence to not be colonial about this, right? Because, you know, a lot of these things are very sort of colonial in their field. The DSM just gets adopted in all these countries, regardless of whether or not it's a good cultural 
fit for how they think about things, how this, what their society values, what they want to, you know, and so what we want to make sure we do is not replicate that very colonial top down, a bunch of white men sitting around a table, you know, at a lobster lunch or something. Seriously, like that's how this stuff happens. I'm not, like I wish I was making it up. It's really true. And, you know, in Geneva or, you know, Washington, D.C. or wherever health policies in these manuals are written, not that they don't care and potentially do good work and help people and uh, some cool things can come out of that. I don't mean to entirely, you know, bash on them, but like, you know, to, to make sure that we have included a lot of voices at the table from a whole lot of um, traditional cultures, indigenous cultures, mainstream cultures, scientists, you know, uh, people of vast range of religions, languages, and regional needs, predilections, biases, taboos, um, linguistic sensibilities, preferences, and figure out how in the world we can take the essential goods, the essential underlying utilities, and translate these in a way that these cultures go, yep, that was good. Thank you. That helped us. Good on you. Right? That's what we're looking for that thumbs up rather than, oh, they did this to us. Like, no, we together helped us do something useful. So it's a very, very different mentality. And that's the anthropology project. And it's trying to figure out what are the needs of the people who run the APA as a tribe? What are their needs? What are the needs of mainstream clinicians? What are the needs, main, needs of alternative clinicians? What are the, the needs? How do those change across countries? What's the needs of the World Health Organization? What are the needs of healthcare systems, the MBAs, the lawyers, the, the, you know, the, the insurance companies? What are their needs? Because anthropo the, the techniques of anthropology are very profound and can be applied to all these different lenses that pretty much nobody has looked at, right? And we would love the resources to actually go to all the players being affected by this at all these different levels, organizational, individual, societal, geographical, and to say, hey, what do you need? What do you care about? What's important to you? What do you not want? And, and how does this make a difference for you? It's really, again, it's, that, it's, it's the ethics of autonomy and justice and equity being scaled to a societal level, an institutional level, a governmental level, a regional, and then hopefully a global level. Um, and really making sure that that basis of medical ethics is being followed to the highest standards we can possibly follow them. And that will require uh, an immense amount of expertise, That's cultural take sensitivity. A lot and... of money, a lot of people, a lot of time, a lot of people yeah. coming together and long conversations over decades to really figure out how to do that well, which is again why this is a resource intensive project, but we think we can definitively argue is mandated by the fundamental principles of medical ethics and hopefully everybody's needs because nearly everybody either is going to get into this territory or is going to know somebody who's going to get into this territory you know and they may not have told you but they are into this right if any if even the course summary surveys that you know 49 percent of whatever of people have had a mystical experience this is a massive global issue right that deserves attention so everyone is a stakeholder, whether they know it or not. Everyone Correct. has a seat at the table. And, right. Uh, and we want to, to make, make sure they have a voice in the process, which is very different from basically every other attempt at this, where it was a proprietary religion, tradition, professional society, group of elite, whoever's, or just people, you know, often some remote location who were just cut off from the conversation for whatever reasons. Yeah, so uh, an immense, extremely ambitious project that, you know, that's I right, very much hopeful succeed. Uh, yep. The communications project. Yes, the communications project takes the anthropology project and takes the findings of all of the other projects, and then figures out how do you communicate these? How do you translate this into enough languages that essentially everybody you can reasonably reach has this in a language that they can understand? Has this has terms in their language that now apply to this? Do you, if you need to create new linguistic terms, right? We may need to create new words, right? How do you then spread those words? How do you interface with social media? How that's a that this in of itself is a staggeringly large and mind-boggling question, right? I'd like just let the weight of that sink in for a second. How do you interface with the scientific literature? How do you interface with the textbooks of 
you know, mainstream psychiatry or alternative psychiatry? How do you interface with the, the things of board criteria that are on the examinations? Another form of communication. Um, how do you deal with the mainstream media, the alternative media, like news? How do you, how do you language this so that, how, how do you communicate this to the power structures that be, the major religions, the Abrahamic religions, the, you know, Hinduism, Buddhism, or the big five uh, religions across the world, but all the other religions, right? The indigenous religions and, and all, you know, smaller niche religions and cultures and fusion religions. How do you have language that looks at what they already know and says this to them in a way that they can understand? As a great French occultist apparently said, telling people something they cannot understand is as bad as telling them a lie. We don't want to do that. We want to tell people something they can understand. And they go, okay, I get that. That makes sense. Cool. Okay, now I can thank you. That was useful. And I feel like we've connected, right? So it's that, how do you can connect with people in, in a way that is beneficial for all of these sides? How do you hear them and their needs? How do you they hear your needs? And how do you, they hear just the information that they can then operationalize in some useful way that just makes their lives better? and their societies and communities better. And so the communication project is very specifically focusing on that huge issue, which again is a huge issue. Like our, you know, our white paper is like 337 pages or something crazy. You know, like just how many languages do we need to translate that into? I think probably 20, like that in and of itself, just to translate the plan is a big plan. And then how do you communicate with the people who then want to respond back to you who don't happen to speak English, for example, right? I, you know, I, I don't personally have any other language that where I have sufficient linguistic skills to communicate this in. I, you know, I've got a little bit of French and Hindi and Spanish and Latin and teeny hints of Greek and Pali and Sanskrit, but like I, I couldn't talk, I couldn't give this podcast in any other language. So we need pe people who can. Right. And that's a lot of training and a lot of work and a lot of money and a lot of interest and a lot of time and resources. But this is an essential thing. Again, if we're going to scale this globally and be part of this conversation, we have to have linguistic ex experts and topic spe specific experts that can cross these barriers of language and, and communications. Yeah. And slightly tangential because it isn't strictly about the language in which the information is presented, but uh, a plug for unified mindfulness, Shinzen Young's uh, system, I think, is a small start to kind of systematizing and providing somewhat neutral language uh, that could hopefully be refined. Relatively uh, neutral. Yeah, relatively as these neutral. things go. As these things go. It's, right. it's, it's a start. I would agree. Yeah, um, it's a start. And yeah. that's the kind of project that is very interesting. And then the question is, how does that scale across cultures? and settings and what are the functional outcomes of scaling that so if you give someone unified mindfulness as a linguistic system versus another systems so this is also comparative linguistics this takes a lot of time and you know so if various linguistic frameworks how do those impact outcomes and these are the things that systems tend to be reluctant to do trials of because they all want to say no our system but in my ideal world, you would actually, hey, we'll compare to unified mindfulness to like a Graphian sort of a system to uh, this system to that, whatever systems, you know, just pick your pick a bunch and like say, hey, we give system naive people, <clears throat> you know, in some kind of randomized way or whatever, these systems and just see what happens. What happens when you do this? Because language is very powerful, as we know. And so um, getting the language part right is critical. Yeah, and the only way you're going to be able to achieve that is through uh, very, very skillful, the most skillful communication so that nobody feels like there is anything to lose in that kind of dialogue, that yes. kind of collaboration. And that is a, that's a difficult or proposition. if they're losing something, it's something they're happy to have lost. Right, right, right. <laughs> uh, the special projects. The special project is basically all the other things that kind of didn't fit into another category. And it's these sort of unique kind of, or niche applications and, and various ways of looking at things. So I'll start with the big data project. And the big data project is looking at social media and the big data that's available from social media and online that people have collected and that various firms have collected to see how much do we already know? How much is already there? Because people, you can go online and find countless forums where people describe emergent phenomena and their adventures and they tweet about this stuff. And, oh, I went on a retreat and it was so whatever, weird, great, terrible, challenging, amazing, I don't know. And, and then you could follow these people forward and say, hey, they did this thing. And then what happened as a result of that? How did that 
that affect their consumer behavior or their relationships or the socializing or their frequency of their Twitter posts or how fast they could type or what they're typing about or the structure of like now what kind of concepts and things are they bringing in or their influences or their mental health or their medications they're suddenly talking about or oops, ooh, like, you know, or like, oh my gosh, now they're suddenly flourishing. And we have data like, you know, going back at least 15, 18, 20 years, maybe depending on how, you know, to early days of the internet, you might be able to find stuff back to the 90s, where you can follow people's perspectively forward. In, in a way, it's all open stuff. And then even using like anonymized data from the big data sources. So for exact, example, Dr. Shiri Dora Cohen is one of the projects we want to support. She's a Twitter scholar, she can query the Twitter database. And the Twitter bit database is massive. And we would like to do that for Google and Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and all these other, you know, big online forums, Reddit, and et cetera. And, 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 you know, in a very ethical way, that's super important. Again, we're into ethics. We're really into ethics. Like, make sure we're not, you know, disclosing personal details or compromising security or doing any bad stuff, right? So critical, we get that part right. But we think that people have already crowdsourced answers to a staggering number of these questions in a very rubber meets the road, real world, not academic. They're out there in, the, in their lives. Actually, like as people, how does this help? How does this make a difference? What's out there? What's the range? And people, they when they start getting into this stuff, they start looking around and going, oh, I found this teacher. I read this book. I went on this retreat. I took this substance. I you know engaged with this practitioner or healthcare practitioner, or I, I looked at this framework. I, I came up with these ideas. And then you get to see the outcomes of all of that. And yeah, the data is super messy, but it is huge and we can't possibly collect anything like that. There's no way we could collect that. It's the only way, there's, it's impossible, but people can voluntarily crowdsource it. Yeah, it's biased and it's gonna have all these issues, but we think within that is gold that we literally are not gonna be able to get any other way. And so the big data project is our, you know, we have some pilot studies going on now that we've just figured out how to fund and it's going forward to figure out how we can use this incredible wealth of shared human collective experience to help that same collective to do better with regard to emergent phenomena. And so that's just one of them. I'll stop there and see if you have any thoughts on that. Uh, I mean, as someone who has been active and has gained a lot from the kind of the crowdsourced wisdom that you're, you're describing, if we could, yeah, exactly, do, do, it, do what you're describing, extract all of the, the wisdom that is just present, but distributed and not uh, collated or integrated. I mean, absolutely, that two thumbs up. Thanks. And then other special projects are like related to security and defense. So for example, do I have ample evidence that this has security implications? Yes, both good and bad, right? That these phenomena, imagine like some of the weirder phenomena that you've either heard people get into or you yourself have gotten into happening to someone who had their finger on the button right, or had access to substantial weapons capabilities or substantial virology modification capabilities or control of significant power grids or whatever. Like, it, you don't have to think very far before you're like, these people need to have a sophisticated understanding of this so that they can maximize good outcomes. Just gonna kind of stop there really important. I've already had some conversations with some people at some three and five letter agencies. Um, and we're going to have more of those. And this is important because they already have some understanding of these, but not nearly as sophisticated as I would like them to. And, and then also like imagine space. So for example, we, we have of the 500 or so people who have been into space, we know it for certain that four of them, and the, Edgar Mitchell being the most famous example, who co-founded IONS, the Institute for Noetic Sciences in 73, I think, but um, who had these profound experiences while they were in space, but the missions then were relatively short. And th these were incredibly transformative emergent experiences. But imagine someone on like a 15 month mission to Mars, getting into super contemplative territory and then having these experiences. We need people on the ground who already have protocols in place based on excellent data. So you're not just shutting these people down with antipsychotics or whatever. Instead, you're making sure you maximize cognitive function. These are billion dollar missions with incredibly trained people. You wanna make sure that their cognition is as sharp as it possibly can be. So they're just not dead weight, but can in fact contribute meaningfully and perhaps even better to the mission as a result of their cognitive enhancements and maximize healing and well being and intercrew you know, um, function. And in a way that that has a sophisticated understanding of emergent phenomena, should anything like that arise. 
And so these are some of the things that the special projects um, look at and say, hey, this is really stuff we want to, to be doing. And another one of these is like the Famous People Emergent Project is really like looking, and some people have already started some compilations of this, like what are the benefits that have come to society of you know, from emergent phenomena. And I listed a bunch of very obvious cases of reported these things that seem to have enhanced cognition, enhanced capacity to see things and make connections as a result of their spiritual uh, journey. Um, and that's one of the things. And then also like an FDA uh, style reporting subproject. So this is where we think, for example, imagine if people who are teaching eight week MBSR courses reported the good and bad of what happened to people. If they run into strange phenomena, if they run into really cool phenomena, and just reported those, and there was large government databases that could just collect this the same way we do for medications, vaccine trials, you know, post-marketing data where this stuff gets out of the populations, and then you learn all this other stuff, like Biox was a really interesting example. We actually could kind of see it in the original data. It was kind of covered up, kind of a scandal there. But then going forward in populations, you started to see the vascular problems that it was causing um, in terms of cardiovascular disease. And in the same kind of way, we think there need to be nationalized reporting mechanisms, and particularly the countries that have nationalized health services, where they're giving people, you know, perhaps emergent interventions of psychedelics or whatever, and we want them collecting data on the good, the bad, and the weird prospectively as part of what they do so that we can get, you know, we can maximize the fact that they're already getting this data anyway, people are going to be presenting to practitioners, and we want to be able to look at this to help gain a really nuanced prospective, large population-based, for real, sense of the good, the bad, and the strange. So again, to inf you know help us with informed choices. And yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm incredibly biased, but I think all of this is the most important thing that you know we, we could be paying attention to. <laughs> but... Yeah, I obviously am <laughs> super excited about this as well. So, but obviously there's lots of other competing things for resources, again, like heart Definitely. disease and COVID and yeah. you know, trauma and yeah. violence and although again incredibly change. biased but the, these these phenomena i i hope uh you know with skillful uh skillful management the, the speaking of the management project uh yep. have will have cascading benefit for all of those other related problems that That'd is awesome. that is a, that is an optimistic dream and perhaps will not come to fruition but even if it doesn't have any of those cascading benefits it's super important yeah, wage inequality, another critical one, social justice. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool, right. and then the value and impact project is really the last one. And this is making sure that we're doing something useful. Speaking of value and impact and competing priorities, like it is really essential that we be able to measure in a rubber meets the road kind of terms, what is the effect on hospital bedtimes? What is the effect on medication usage? What is the effect on the cost of healthcare systems? Do people become better or worse consumers or like just have a lower carbon footprint or not as a result of these kinds of things? You know, and so to look across a range of essential metrics, quality adjusted life years and, you know, um, people return, you know, utilization of healthcare system resources and function in society and meeting their own personal goals, right? So what are, at looking at from the individual level to the, the community level, to the, the government level, to the population-based level, what are the actual value and impact of the science that we're doing? Are we making a difference? Are we actually helping and being willing to be critical about ourselves and really evaluate our programs, our projects, once we have enough to actually evaluate, right? Once we have enough resources and programs so you can do and say, hey, are we doing something useful? And to be be willing to be critical of ourselves and saying, hey, is this does this make sense? Are, are we doing good here? Are we all right? Um, and also recognizing that the MBA is kind of one for the control of the healthcare system. Like anybody who's a doctor out there and you haven't figured this out, let me tell you as someone who also worked in healthcare administration, the MBA is one and the MBAs care about quality metrics. They care about the numbers. And if you can't make the numbers work, you're never going to get the stuff adopted globally. And if you can make the numbers work, it probably doesn't actually matter how weird it is. They'll probably go with it anyway if it helps them get their Christmas bonuses or Hanukkah bonuses or whatever bonuses. You see what I mean? Actually, probably Passover or something. But anyway, you get the idea. Um, and so the point is that, um, that like, if you can't figure this out, you're, it's not going to work. And I think one of the failures of nearly every previous project that has attempted this 
is they didn't get that economic rubber meets the road. You got to make it work on paper to an economist, to a business person, to an MBA. And if you can't do that, you're probably dead on arrival. And we very much want to do that. We very much want to figure out the win, 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 wins. We're not only the individuals, but the healthcare providers, the healthcare systems, the hospitals, the, the governmental programs, the insurance programs, the, the, the ecosystem where people are really winning. And this is just a natural synergistic point of like, yep, that is good. And it's good from every single point of view, or at least as many as you could reasonably expect it to be good from. Thank you. We'll take that. Those are the wins we're looking for because the rest we don't think is going to scale. It's not going to work. And I, we went back and analyzed basically every previous project, going back to William James and his unbelievably good book, The Varieties of Religious Experience, which you absolutely should read if you haven't. Um, but and going, why did they fail? Why did these incredible movements, like the stuff coming out of the transpersonal people and the Esalen and you know the the Groffs and you know um, Abraham Maslow and uh, all, you know all these other people, like that were were trying to change this and just getting almost no mainstream clinical penetration. It's because the economics was never really fully taken into account and, and the value and impact was never willing to be critically measured. And that, so we're very interested in making sure that we're being honest about whether or not this is actually a good idea and measuring that carefully based on a range of metri metrics. Yeah, I mean, regardless of your, your your concerns, comments, or qualms with the current global economic order, it is what it is. And if it if whatever your project is does not fit within it, you're not likely to go uh, very far. And as, that's right. As the grandson of a, of a of an economist, you know the econometrics. You if you, you got you got to have them. You can't. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, and right. it will take a while to get there. Like that will yeah. take a while to to figure out all those impacts, but very much on the roadmap and a critical part of what we're doing. And hopefully we'll have the resources to do all of those studies as well and make sure that we aren't just another rah-rah team project that Which doesn't really look <laughs> critically at itself. Yeah, I mean, that'd be cool. But then someone else would have to come after us and actually do the thing that we then didn't do. I, yeah, yeah. I, I appreciate the, the nuance and the multi-perspectival uh, you know, nature of, of how how you and everybody at the at, at the EPRC is approaching this it's the only time i've ever seen these issues discussed with such nuance and concern for all of the angles so thank you thanks yeah we we don't mean to be needlessly proud but we think that we can confidently say that uh, there isn't any other plan out there quite like this that i've seen there's a lot of other cool projects but there's nothing else quite like this and, and so I think this is something special. We actually hope that other people adopt similar views and join in, even if they're competing teams. Great, competition can be, make markets thrive, fine, why not? You know, go out and try to do the same thing your, your way with your team and with your people or join us and we can all collectively do it. And we can, you know, whatever, however works best to get the job done. We're actually way more interested in being done than the fact of any particulars about who does it. Right. So if you've got a team and you've got the money to go do this, please go do this. Right. Yay. Thanks. We won't have to. Awesome. Thank you. Um, we'd be very excited. But like, so it's, the, it's in that kind of spirit, which again is really rare. Right. So really, we just, it needs to be done and uh, trying to figure out how it's going to happen. Oh, one thing I'd like to talk about just real quickly is the Emergence Research Center. If you got a second. So okay. like on. one of the many projects we'd like to do is the Emergence Research Center. And the Emergence Research Center is where we have top neuroimaging, biometric, qualitative and quantitative data, voice, face re re recognition, speech patterns, mood, epigenetics, genetics, cortisol, biomarkers, full fMRI, EEG, et cetera, whatever other imaging modalities. Um, to people to bring a lot of different traditions in of people who do things that get pretty strong effects. Right? So intensive practice of whatever kind that gets effects that we likely think would be measurable in a reasonable time course, some number of days or weeks or months or something relatively compressed from a whole range of traditions and see what's the same about them, different about them, how do they handle and language various things, what are the outcomes that these people leave that intensive practice or, or whatever setting, and then go forward out into the world to have the resources to follow them 
prospectively to measure for qualitative and quantitative outcomes and to see what do they do well, what not so much, what are the common thing experiences that they get into, what are the unique experiences that they get into, maybe other traditions don't get into, sort of a pushback against perennialism, maybe they do something that's really super special and nobody else does, as a lot claim, and I'm not sure it's true for many of them, but maybe it really is, we can answer some of these questions, and then what are the underlying pathways to the degree that we can measure this, and what happens if you do these practices, so, so someone could come in and say, hey, I was thinking of doing this super cool practice versus this super cool practice. And we would actually have object objective data collected the same way for the short, medium, and long term so that people could really go, yeah, this is likely you know, the range of what happens and really help the, the phenomenology project, the predisposing factors project, the underlying phenomenology project, the diagnosis and management project, because each of these traditions are going to have their own ways to diagnose and management, manage these kinds of things and then help figure out how in the world that relates to psychedelics and mental health and how each of these traditions language and communicate this and, and what sort of, you know, specific frameworks are they looking at, you know, at it through what kind of cultural trappings may make a difference and just do that science in a way that again, is not rah-rah team, but like, hey, look at all these cool teams and they're doing all these cool things and what are the similarities and differences and what can we you know, figure out about a rough clinical physiological perennialism versus now that's something unique. That really is a whole different thing. We don't see anything like else like that anywhere else. You know, maybe their claims to being unusually special are true. I don't know. Cool. But just answering those questions. And that's one of the many projects we hope to be able to do, including helping Jay Sanguinetti and Shenzhen Young at the SEMA, SEMA lab and all the cool neuroscience and ultrasound research they're doing there in imaging, as well as other studies, right? So we've got other places that we work with. Um, Vanderbilt Brain Institute, for example, and Dave Vago and the cool work he does. would like to be able to find some, find some more resources for him and his team. So yeah, that, that gives you a sense of us. Um, hopefully that gives people a good sense of what the EPRC is about. Um, and then remember, Emergence Benefactor is the charity designed to support it all. Um, we, the EPRC, basically, we created Emergence Benefactors to be the bank, to have the granting capabilities, the grant administration capabilities, to be able to hold and aggregate funds and, and allocate them in a very reasonable way with, you know, good transparency and, and uh, you know, board regulation and accountants and lawyers and all that kind of stuff. So that we're making sure we're doing all that right. And so Emergence Benefactors, Remember, you know, also to help support emergence benefactors as well, because it, emergence benefactors lends a tremendous amount of support back to the EPRC yeah, and if, its allies in the field as well. Excellent. If you, if you're listening to this and you you have uh, the the resources around or your expertise, please, 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 <laughs> you know, like this. Yeah, I can't I can't adequately express my enthusiasm. <laughs> Fun, 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 this stuff. Uh, it's, it's just the most exciting thing that uh, I am aware of. And uh, yeah, um, unless you have anything more to say, uh, Daniel, uh, maybe, maybe where, I mean, I'll, I'll provide links in the description, but if there's any other contact info or anything you think we should wrap up with before we, we turn off here. Yeah, info at T-H-E-E-P-R-C dot O-R-G is how you would get in touch with the E-P-R-C and info at eBenefactors dot org is how you would get in touch with eBenefactors. And uh, we're very happy to chat with you if you've got a sense of how your spark of joy and resources, talents, networks, um, capabilities, institution, um, tradition, or whatever would like to in interface with our project to be a scientist, a clinician, a study subject, a supporter in some kind of other way with other skills and communications or business or graphics or whatever it is you, you do. We've had all kinds of people with a wide range of talents reach out to us and help us. We have people in our organization who are doing incredibly useful things who haven't even uh, graduated from high school. And we have people all the way to emeritus professors and people who have been doing this you know, for longer than I've been alive and uh, everything in between. And so uh, we're very open. We're, we need a lot of diversity of talents, of perspectives, of capabilities, of cultures. So please feel welcome to reach out to us and uh, we can see where all these things align. Where is that, that spark of, yeah, where talents, resources, and sparks of joy meet with the needs of the project. All right. Thanks so much, Daniel, for coming on. And please get in contact, get in touch with, with Daniel, the PRC Emergence Benefactors. Thanks so much for listening and watching. And uh, may, may all beings be released from all suffering. May everyone be very happy. <laughs> and uh, yeah, may, may, may all these efforts succeed. Thank you. It's delightful. All right.